this moment. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's a great honour to be here, actually, uh, for me. And um, I just wish there were more days yeah. in the year so I could travel around a bit more and, and meet lots more gardeners. And, um, so today's I'm, I'm concentrating on no dig, but I'm also explaining about growing great vegetables. The two go together very much, but the basis, the fundamental, is very much soil and soil life. I've just spent a very interesting weekend teaching students at um, University of Kassel, Witzenhausen, and I noticed there how I got the feeling so much of what they've been learning at the university is about soil chemistry. And I was getting all these questions all the time about nutrients and, ah, and all this compost you're putting on is too much nitrate and phosphor and actually things I don't really know much about myself in terms of numbers anyway and analysis, you know, and the figures. Um, what what I I'm <coughs> work with and what I'm explaining is much more about how plants grow. For me, that's the, the best way of analysing your soil, you know, not a lab test. Just look at growth. And uh, there may be some deficiencies, in fact, I'm sure there are in, in my approach, but it's very based on observation and um, through observation, understanding more about soil and plant growth. I'm not convinced that soil chemists really understand how plants grow. You know, the uptake of nutrients, how actually does that happen? And a lot of it is to do with biology and life in the soil. And I don't think chemists are very good at looking at biology. And that comes back to how science, modern science, is so compartmentalized and fragmented. And so lots of people have different little bits of information <clears throat> and they're not always talking to each other enough and putting it all together. And where it's all put together is in the garden. So you can be scientists as well. You know, the, the, the original meaning of the word science is in Renaissance Europe, it was about understanding nature. And that's what this is about. And a key part of nature is soil. And it's interesting how in the UK, um, until recently, we had we have something called the Soil Association, and uh, they were founded in 1945, and it was all about soil compost, life in the soil, and then by 1960 they'd almost forgotten about that side of it, and they were actually fighting battles, com campaigning against chemicals in farming. They became more a campaigning organisation um, against DDT and GM and all those things. And it's only recently that the actual soil association themselves have remembered about, hang on a minute, soil, we need to understand. Because, um, you know, you can be organic, you can be organic certified, which is one of the things they do, and yet you can use a rotavator, you can, you can knacker your soil, but you're still organic because you're not using chemicals. So this is much more than just being organic. It's, it's about <coughs> understanding and embracing and encouraging life in the soil which creates health in the plants, which then creates health in us, that whole loop of positive health, which is much more than absence of disease. So, this is me in, what about lights actually? Should we maybe have half the lights out? Or? <coughs> this is uh, my holding in Somerset's. The, the area I crop for vegetables is around a thousand square meters. The whole garden, there's my house, and the whole garden is like that. It's 3,000 square meters roughly. And for my, from my 1,000 square meters, um, I'm selling in a year around 21,000 pounds worth of produce, to give you an idea. <coughs> Most of that is bags of mixed salad, because that's the highest value produce. As a small grower, you're looking at um, high value products. But we're also raising a lot of vegetables for um, home use and for the courses we run. Steph, Steph, who's here, by the way, if you want to have a chat, um, she makes these amazing lunches for the courses based on vegetables. And that's also contributed to her writing a book about <laughs> how you process your vegetables and turn them into lovely food. So there's a lot about that as well. Um, OK. What is no dig? Right, let's crack on. <coughs> yep. Next picture. The way I've come to 
practice it is um, through a lot of trial and error. When I started out, I was using different mulches, like hay, for example. And now pretty much the only mulch I use is compost. Of course, compost is such a big word. <laughs> um, any, anything decomposed, basically. You know, like, so it doesn't, and it's not always perfect. You can see this compost here, it's not perfectly smooth, little lumps, bits of wood, that's fine. Um, but basically mostly decomposed and, and in pieces not too big and that's compost on the surface it might be old animal manure leaf mold compost you've made compost you buy green waste compost we call that <coughs> compost used for growing mushrooms mushroom compost so many possibilities for getting hold of the organic matter using it in a form that's decomposed because then <coughs> in our climate we're maybe even slightly wetter than you are actually we are and, and we get more slugs so this, this method of mulching is very good for not having too many slugs. And I'm putting the compost straight on. The, in this case, that was <coughs> 15 centimetres compost. This is quite a big dose in year one only. So carrots in it. And, and that was year one carrots. <coughs> so they have grown through the compost. And then these little roots, that was four months later, are actually going into the soil below. <coughs> So as, you, as the weeds die, this, this was compost simply put on weeds, as the weeds die, that soil below becomes open and available to plants growing above. And sometimes when I'm talking to gardeners, I notice that they've misunderstood the whole process. They think you're just growing in the surface compost, like patio gardening. No, no. This is about encouraging soil. So this is when I first arrived at Homemakers six years ago. Um, it was like that. It looks brown there just because the, I employed a tractor to just kill, chop the grass. <coughs> so it's old grass lying on top. But it's basically a lot of um, grass, dandelions, buttercups, perennial weeds as well, cooch grass, <coughs> bindweed. Mm -hmm. And then I was taking delivery of some, that compost is old cow manure, maybe two years old, and using it as much. So that was December. The next photograph is June. So there's a result of very quick, quickly making a garden, simply putting compost on the weeds and the undisturbed soil. So preserving all the soil structure and life. And when I explain this to professional gardeners in the UK, they find it really hard to understand because it's, it's no dig, I think, is more difficult for people who, who are experienced and who've always been used to cultivating soil. But beginners, I've noticed, just get it very quickly. Because it's, it's actually, it's really simple. You know, this soil here, which is growing grass and weeds, it, it, it already has a structure. It's just a question of how you kill the grass and weeds so that your plants can use the, what's there already. You don't need to improve it. You don't need to work it. Um, doing that, you will lose a lot of things like organisms in the soil, uh, moisture, carbon. You know, it's all there. So the main thing that's happening here is about killing the weeds <coughs> and different ways of doing that. So 15 centimeter compost in that case, you know, this is not the only way, but these are different ways. Cardboard, just cardboard there um, on the pathways. So that's excluding light. That's the key phrase, light exclusion, because <coughs> in darkness, weeds can't grow. Well, they try to grow and then they try to grow some more but they can't photosynthesize, and so eventually that parent root <coughs> dies. And this method of mulching is a more efficient way of getting rid of perennial weeds, difficult weeds, 100%, than trying to dig them out. The only weeds I dig out <coughs> are docks. Is this okay in German? I hope that you're all understanding me. Uh, does anyone, you all know what docks are? No. <laughs> well, Felix, can you translate? You know. That's it, yeah, it's very, very tall, big leaves, dramatic, and the root is sort of slightly orange and brown and, and really huge. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so it's just only because it's got so, so much power in that, if, it, if it's a big dot, that is, it's so much power in that, that's one weed that I would just use a spade. Don't not dig the whole dock out, but not the whole root, but just to cut off the top 15 centimeter maybe and that weakens it so much, then it dies under a mulch after that. And the, are, are you mostly understanding me, hopefully? Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, 
The, the other um, type of weed I would remove, like with a spade, is um, woody weeds. So um, brambles, you know, like blackberries, um, anything with a woody stem, because that also would grow through much. But basically everything that was here was like <coughs> uh, more sappy, grassy, um, even bindweed, so that's just mulch. And then if we go on and look at the next picture, you'll see <coughs> during year one, I'm differentiating here. Year one is if you're starting with a lot of weeds particularly. You know, you've really got to focus that number one priority, kill the weeds. Then your ground is clean. And this is all about time saving. <coughs> you know, I figure that people say to me things like, oh, you know, no dig, it's okay, but where do you get all the compost? And she's, well, it's not that difficult, you know, look around and um, it's available, organic matter, there's, there's plenty of it. What, what you are really short of and what I urge you to look at is that the, the other thing you really don't have enough of is time. You know, how many of us have lots of spare time? And this is such a time-saving method, but you just need to get it right in year one, like where the greenhouse is there and around, <coughs> this was pretty solid cooch grass. Um, is cooch grass okay? Over, over mm -hmm. yeah. So, right. perennial weeds, basically, you know, roots that have very persistent weeds in the, the roots in the soil. That if you if you don't get rid of them in the beginning, they just come back and come back, and you just waste so much time. So this is about saving time by not needing to do much weeding in ongoing for years after. So, in this case, I put more cardboard. I'm, I'm killing the weeds in the pathways and in the beds, you know, to have it all clean. It's no good having weedy paths and nice beds because the weeds in the paths will just spread in the beds. So the cardboard is really useful for that. This is only year one. I'm not using cardboard in year two and on. It's just the initial weed kill that's happening here. <coughs> so cardboard doesn't last more than maybe 10, 12 weeks before it decomposes. Then the weeds grow through if they're strong weeds. So then we put more on top. And so you just need to find enough cardboard. <laughs> but there is a lot of it around in year one. And the other thing that's different in year one is temporary wooden sides, like that, because the, I find that useful to hold the compost in place. When we're putting compost on beds, um, there's lots of related little things here, like you know how wide your beds are. I'll, I'll cover that as we go along. But I mean, these beds, for example, here are 1.5 metre wide. They're the trial beds, dig bed and no dig. And then going towards the autumn, you can see there's no more cardboard, no more need for cardboard, and uh, all the weeds are dead. It's basically clean soil now. Um, but I'm maintaining that clean soil and feeding it as well with <coughs> um, maybe rough compost, not perfect, or some composted wood, a few, or fine wood, wood shavings, not big pieces of fresh wood chip. And woody mulches are useful, I find, for paths. <coughs> but basically, you know, they are feeding the soil in the path as much as compost is feeding the soil on the bed. <coughs> it's about feeding soil, not feeding plants. That's a key difference in so much uh, debate in horticulture unconsciously assumes things like we're talking about feeding plants, but actually no, that it, we need to be thinking about feeding soil. And then if you feed your soil, all your plants are fed automatically. I mean, this is one element of what I was saying. It's so simple. And I think people do find that difficult. We were talking about it last night. There's some really good no-dig growers here from Luxembourg, Kraukar, who created a fantastic no-dig garden. And, and they were saying that, you know, talking to people, they just find it, they want to make it more complex. I think it's a human trait sometimes to um, make things complicated. This is a really, really simple approach. Okay. <coughs> so then that's going into year two. And you can see there's not many wooden sides. There are here just because these are trial beds up the further and no more wooden sides. One reason I don't like wooden sides as well is two main ones. One is <coughs> cost. And e even on like smaller gardens, you know, you, you can manage without them. Um, just have your beds more mounded. And the other factor is slugs again, because old wood as it decays is perfect habitat for slugs. So if we look at the next picture, you'll see how, as the garden evolves, it becomes <coughs> very clean, very tidy. Um, you can see the only one size here is the trial beds. Everything else is, is simple, open beds, slightly raised. And I'm mulching the beds with compost and the paths with slightly woody mulch, but preferably decomposed a bit. 
and the bed width varies like 1.5 meter, 1.2 meter, there's some one meter wide beds there. The reason for that is it's <coughs> that's actually not about efficiency, it's because this is a trial garden as well as a market garden. So I'm trialing lots of different things and it's very useful for teaching, I find, to have beds of different widths to show people. And it's also useful for me, if I have wide beds, I can make that key point again with no dig, you can walk on your beds. <coughs> because in traditional horticulture you can't, because you used a spade or fork or rotavator, you fluffed up the soil, made it all loose, and then if you walk on it, it all goes down again. It's like, you know, <laughs> you haven't really got anywhere. But with this method, the soil is open, but it's also firm. And this causes a lot of misunderstandings because firm soil is good. Uh, but there's lots of people out there who manufacture rotavators and rototillers who want to persuade you that, no, you need to have your soil loose and fluffy, uh, particularly for sowing and planting. Uh, no, you don't actually. But uh, automatically, by putting some compost on top, you've got just a soft surface material. That's great. But it's not, for, the softness, you know, doesn't last for very long. And then you're down into quite firm, but that's good. Uh, plants like rooting into firm soil because that gives them more anchorage in windy weather. And um, it holds the moisture better and everything. So it just ticks all the boxes. <coughs> to have it firm and you can walk on the beds if you need to. So that means you can have wide beds because you can put your foot in the middle or even walk on them. Okay. And so that following from that picture, the previous one was June and that's September. <coughs> and between these two photographs, almost every vegetable is different. So we're doing a lot of second planting. In, in my climate, I'm finding um, most vegetables mature in half a year. There are actually not many vegetables that need a whole year or whole season to grow. So we're doing sowings in February, March under cover, planting out late March, early April under fleece, cropping in May, June and July, and then re-sowing, replanting in the summer. So literally the only crops I can see there which have done more than half a season is the climbing beans, <coughs> a bit of celeriac there, and <laughs> that's pretty much it, actually. So think in terms of you know how much more you can get from your ground with double cropping. And one thing we're not doing, though, with the second cropping, we're not putting any more compost on. So <coughs> the compost, the feeding the soil, it's once a year. It's not every time you sow a plant. <coughs> because it's not about feeding plants. It's feeding the soil. And compost is not water-soluble nutrients. This is key point and um, again causes a lot of misunderstanding because some people sort of think compost must be like fertilizer and, and then they say well you should only put it on in the spring otherwise the nutrients are washed out. Well I'm finding that you know I put all my compost on November, December. <coughs> I like to get it done by Christmas and then have a bit of time off in January and just know that the soil is mulched and fed. It's covered over winter with compost. Uh, not green manures because we're growing vegetables. We haven't got time to grow a green manure in the growing season. <coughs> but we're doing final clearing of the beds through late October, November. Even now, there's still quite a lot of growing at the moment. And then spreading the, annual, the mulch for the whole year in November and December. And that holds the goodness. The rain washes through. You know, if the nutrients were leaching out, it could not be looking like that in September because that's 10 months since there was any, anything given to the soil as a, any kind of feed. So all these crops are growing with what the stored goodness um, from that. The only occasion this might not work, I'd like to know more about it, would be sandy soil, which as, I, uh, <coughs> as far as I know, doesn't hold on to nutrients quite so well, um, or moisture obviously. But I suspect that if you build up a, a good layer of organic matter on top of even quite sandy soil, um, this can work very well. My soil here is silt, by the way. It's uh, a dense, <coughs> it's a very good soil. I've also done no dig on clay and on stony soil. It works on both of those really well. This is one month further on and looking on the far side. So again, everything you see there is second crop. Even these Brussels sprouts, I'll explain that a bit later, but basically we do, <coughs> we plant the Brussels sprouts in the carrot bed. 
So the Brussels sprouts don't need to be planted until June. So that gives time to grow some carrots and then make little holes while harvesting carrots, pop in the Brussels sprout plants. And that, that gives two crops a year again, no more compost given. So, you know, these are hungry plants. And that was the five centimetres of compost once a year. Now, five centimetres is not written in stone. It could be three centimetres. It depends a bit how intensely you want to crop, how big you want your yields to be, how few weeds you want to have. I, I reckon three centimetres is, is minimum uh, for this approach in terms of efficiency of management. We're finding that, this, in my experience, well-fed soil is really happy. <coughs> happy soil doesn't grow weeds. It doesn't need to because <coughs> what are weeds? You know, what, what is their purpose? And um, my experience suggests that weeds are about soil recovering. So disturbed soil needs to recover, just like disturbed people need to recover. And weeds literally recover. This soil, we are doing hardly any weeding to achieve that. <coughs> you know, we actually don't weed, apart from hoeing in the early spring because there's weed seeds in the compost. So a few weed strikes with a hoe. And after that, it's just occasional, usually while picking actually, have two buckets, one for any little weeds, um, little ones, it's good. Um, but it's just no time spent on weeding. A little bit of bindweed around the edge, trying to creep in using a trowel. Okay. So this is the, the bed making process year one. In this case, that's 15 centimeter compost and cardboard piles, as you can see. If, if we'd had more compost, it would be good to put some there before the, more cardboard good before the compost. But um, <coughs> this was doing a big area very quickly and <coughs> we couldn't get enough cardboard. Steph was helping with that and um, even with her excellent foraging talents for finding cardboard, <laughs> we struggled <laughs> finding that. And uh, so it was, I was concentrating in the pathways. <coughs> okay, and then this, again, you can see the, the difference going to June. So you make beds and you can sow or plant straight away if the season's right. You don't have to wait for weeds to die. That's how it can be very speedy. And you can make beds at any time of year, basically. You know, in this case, I was doing it in the winter because I want to get ready for spring. And winter's a great time to set up a garden. You can do so much work in days like today, you know. Weather like this, when even if the soil is wet, because you're not disturbing the soil, the structure's still there. You can be pushing wheelbarrows or whatever you need to do. So you've got access all the time. And yeah, let's go on the next one. Um, June, a few years later. So you can see by this time, all the wooden sides are gone and it's just simple growing. And I just want to illustrate the cropping here, like for example, broad beans, lettuce, potatoes. So that's first crops, examples. And then the next picture shows you September, second crops. So that's cabbage after the broad beans, chard and brassicas after the lettuce and brassicas after the potatoes, just for example. And again, none of those have had any compost for since the previous autumn. And yeah, then we got into March and um, funny enough, that was our main snowfall this year. But this was March the 19th, very interesting time of year because although it can be cold, you got good levels of um, light. And the next picture shows you six hours later. <coughs> <laughs> that wouldn't happen in November, I don't think, or December. <coughs> so you can also see what's starting to grow, broad beans there, so they've overwintered. Um, apparently people, does anybody here do overwintered broad beans? I, I think it might be too cold or, or do you? I can't remember if you do, Felix. Yeah, I try, um, <laughs> if you have um, plastic. You need a shelter, a cover, yeah. Well. I mean, I did actually have mesh over these and uh, it's worth a try because you then get just such early broad beans because they've, they've made so many w roots in the winter. Even these broad beans here, which are little plants, they've got a very big root system, and as soon as it warms up a bit, they just go whoop, like that, much faster than if you sow them in the spring. Um, yeah, let's look at the next picture now. So we're now jumping forward six weeks to May the 3rd, <coughs> and you can see how pretty much the whole garden is planted up. And this was after a very difficult April. April this year was cold and wet, I noticed on social media and things, a lot of 
gardeners, farmers were complaining they couldn't get in their fields because it was too wet. With no dig, it's no problem. You just go on any time. You haven't broken the structure, so the drainage is really good. Likewise, moisture is held in the summer. You know, it ticks boxes both ends. <clears throat> it comes back to that thing. It's really simple. That just really works so well. So we can get on any time in the cold, wet April and plant up the beds. And then my favourite way of doing it is to put fleece over. Horticultural fleece, <clears throat> 25 or 30 grams per square metre. Uh, not the thinnest level, medium thickness. And as the plants grow, they push it up. The advantage, I mean, you could put it on hoops like that, which actually we did there for onions. But then there was a bed of onions here with no hoops, and actually that did pretty well as well. <coughs> uh, the advantage of having fleece flat on the ground in the spring is when you've got not much sun and warmth, but then the sun does come out, and then the, all the warmth is held at ground level near the seedlings, and they grow better for it. And the other big advantage is we get quite a lot of wind, and it, it doesn't blow away so much the fleece when it's flat on the ground rather than on hoops. Okay, look now at the difference. That's still May the 3rd after we take the fleece off. So these crops have been growing. That's the ones that are growing under fleece. Lettuce, calabrese and onions, for example. <coughs> There's more onions there. Um, but look at the difference between that three weeks <coughs> that you can trace the pattern of the different beds. And look at the broad beans that I mentioned. <coughs> May the 3rd. End of May. We were picking broad beans by the end of May. <clears throat> you know, this is 51 degrees north, so it's, you know, it's a mild winter, but it's not particularly hot summer normally. It was a warm May, it must be said. Um, actually, could we just go back to you? Um, <clears throat> so I just want to make the point about how the using the fleece means that uh, uh, sowing at, at the, as early as possible, but not too early. <laughs> it's, a lot of it is judging times of sowing. A lot of success comes from sowing at the right time. Each vegetable is slightly different and you need to get to know those best times. Um, and in the spring you don't want to sow too early because you, sowings tend to catch up. They've got more time ahead of them. Like I don't sow tomatoes until the 20th of March for example. And some people are sowing them in February. Well yeah you'll get a bigger tomato but then usually by April it's getting difficult because it's almost too big before you're ready to plant it out. So it's just judging all those timings for the most efficient growth. And then as we go to summer, the next picture, you'll see the summer sowings, <coughs> like for example, chicories there, after onions and calabrese. The timings are more precise. They were sown on the 10th of July. Um, you know, even if I went to the 15th, that's, that's gonna make quite a difference because the, the key bit of knowledge is one day's growing in July is equivalent to two days in August or four days in September, eight days in October, 16 in November and the whole of December. So if you delay your sowings by too much in the summer, you'll lose a lot of time in the autumn. <clears throat> That's always something to bear in mind. So from, from about mid-July, the, the timings are more important. That's why actually I brought along, there is a spare copy if you want to have a look at <coughs> of my calendar, that the idea of there being um, to remember all the dates of these key sowings in the summer and early autumn to keep the garden full <coughs> all the time right the way through the growing season. And even here, we Steph's picking lettuce there. This lettuce bed, <coughs> we managed to keep in very good health the plants even through the incredible heat. Well, it was incredible for us. We had 31 degrees, <laughs> probably not hot for you, um, but very strong sun. And um, yeah, for me, it was an unusual challenge but we didn't lose a single plant. Everything survived really well, and I think no dig really helps with that, retaining the moisture. We're watering for sure. And like this bed, we could pick 19 kilos uh, in an hour and a quarter, two of us, um, every week for the first four weeks, really productive, then it gets less. So that's a big area of production at that time in August. And then between these letters, as they start to produce less in September, or well, even late August I was planting what you see there. That's not lettuce anymore. Uh, that's <coughs> mustards, salad rocket, and spinach from sowings in August the 10th. That's another key day. Sow spinach on 10th of August. Here it might be the 12th. Make a note. <laughs> but the idea is to, to keep it cropping all the time and um, keep uh, 
something growing in the soil. So, you know, people talk about green manures and cover crops. Basically, for me, vegetables are my cover crops, if you'd like it, to look at it that way. And then in the winter, the compost is the cover. So the, the soil is always covered. And through the growing season, nearly all the time, it's actually growing something. This is another fallacy that comes in to do with, if people look at nutrition in chemical terms and, and ideas, and you, sometimes I hear people say, well, don't you ever give your beds a rest? I mean, what does that mean exactly? <laughs> does soil like to have a rest? I don't think it does, in fact. I think soil is happier <coughs> if, when it, the conditions are warm enough, it's actually growing something. And then you've got all these biological interactions happening. You've got roots in the ground, and they are interacting with fungi in the soil, uh, which is all part of that f soil food web network. Fungi, apparently, if you weigh fungi, I don't know who worked this out, but they're the biggest organism on the planet in terms of kilograms. Soil fungi, things that we never see, really. And so, you know, we really want to encourage them. Obviously, no dig, it does. Um, if you disturb soil, you don't see all the fungal networks that you've broken. I think that's one reason why no dig is so successful, among many others. Okay. These are trials now. So, um, I'm just showing you how I'm doing comparisons. Yep. <clears throat> dig, no dig. So, I have beds side by side. This was at Lower Farm. Dig bed. No dig. This was clay soil, you can see it's more clay, where <coughs> each time with the digging I'm incorporating the compost. I also do a trial with forking where the compost is on top, we'll see that one in a minute. So comparing growth basically. Not visual comparisons, always interesting. And so are the records of harvest. So I've got now 12 years of records of doing this, six years at Lower Farm, you can see the totals at the top there. When I started this, I didn't know, you know, which way it would go. I was hoping the dig bed wouldn't yield more. <laughs> I didn't know. Um, and consistently, the pattern is, is small difference, but generally in favor of no dig. Okay. So, and this is homemakers. <coughs> Very rare photograph of me digging. And <laughs> next photograph shows some compost going in the trench. So that's how we apply the compost there. The soil is on top, turned over, in this case, to kill the weeds. The no-dig bed has the compost <coughs> simply put on, so this took about seven hours the first dig and that took about two hours the first fill. Okay, <coughs> so there's big time saving initially. And then growth varies, it's sometimes more different, sometimes not. Always, it's always fascinating this trial because every vegetable is always some difference and often it's, the differences themselves are different <laughs> from year to year according to weather conditions which obviously is so variable. If, if you have enough space in your plots, it's a sort of trial you could do. You know, trials, home-grown home home trials are fascinating. Obviously, it needs a bit of time to do, but you, you always learn so much just by observing. Um, yeah, let's go on now, because we'll come to this year. So, that bed, I, it's the same dig bed. I dig it every December. So that was dug the previous December, this is January. And the compost is incorporated there, the same, same amount of compost simply put on top. It's actually about a, just under three hours difference now. And then the first plantings, oh, we did this year on 31st of March. <coughs> and so that gives you an idea of how small plants we're putting in the ground. It's very good to put out plants when they're small. That saves propagation time and space. And I find generally they get away more quickly. And I think it is it's helped by no dig because you've got a much better balance of soil ecology. Uh, for example, I don't, I'd love to know more about it, but people say there are beetles that eat slugs. I've never actually seen a beetle eat a slug, but I'm happy to hear that anyway. <laughs> and uh, we do notice that on the dig bed, we get more slug damage than on the no dig. And in fact, the next picture, you will see the growth. This is taking off the fleece, so from, that's the, the plantings of 31st of March, how they look by the 3rd of April, May. Five weeks, just under five weeks of growth. <coughs> and then towards the end of May, look at the difference already. Kohlrabi, there. Dig bed kohlrabi, no dig. You know, what is causing that huge difference? Those plants were exactly the same when they went in. The cabbage behind the potatoes, you can't see quite so well, but what we've noticed when replanting cabbage, we had to replant the cabbage on the dig bed because nearly all of it got killed. Turned out it was wireworms, we found wireworms. 
you know, you read most gardening literature tells you that you need to dig soil to expose the pests for birds to eat. You know, it's a total fallacy. There is so much wrong information out there. You've got to be really careful when you read things to believe it or not. My conclusion from you know doing these kinds of this kind of work is that there's basically a lot of wrong information out there, and <laughs> there are much easier ways. This you know this no dig. Look at the difference in growth up this end particularly. Dig bed peas, no dig. Look at this. This is spinach and beetroot here. It just refused to grow for some reason compared to the no dig bed. I'm not clear entirely why that was, but this year we've noticed more striking differences. It might have been due to the or related to the dry conditions which started to happen in May. Okay. So that was the harvest of cabbage and kohlrabi, dig and no dig. Next one. And that this was on 19th of June, in fact. Um, we got this together for a German photographer who was there, Andrea Arts, and she was filming for a um, Veleda magazine. I can't remember what it's called, but anyway, it's published in uh, every few months, and this will be coming out next March. They're featuring homemakers um, in their magazine. But yeah, look at this difference. This was more due to slugs than anything. Slugs at the carrots on the dig bed, um, and we got harvest okay on the no dig. Salad was about the same. Potatoes, we got more potatoes on the dig. That doesn't happen every year, but this year it did. And in a way, actually, I was quite glad because it's like, otherwise it looks like I'm putting a blight on everything in this way. But the potatoes were bigger. Um, mainly tubers were bigger. The same number of tubers, they just grew bigger. Okay. And then this gives a nice overview. This is September. So that's the dig bed and that's the no dig bed. So you can just see them nicely side by side. And everything there is second planting, so all the first sowings of carrots, beetroot, cabbage, <coughs> potatoes, onions have been taken. And that's the new plantings made in June and July, um, even in August. <coughs> like, for example, that's Kaibrock there. Uh, that's a vegetable worth checking out if you don't know. It's Kailan, a Chinese broccoli crossed with European broccoli and you get the speed of the Chinese allied with the nice tight buds of the European. <laughs> so here I had potatoes and then it was cucumber. So this is a third crop after potatoes and cucumber and very a rapid, what I would call a catch crop really, which means it's just growing very fast and it'll give a little, not a huge harvest. And we've been <gasps> cropping that since mid-October and through November, lovely little, little shoots of broccoli. I mean, something like, a kilo and a half from, from each of those rows. So a worthwhile amount from six plants, you know, that's something you can do quite quickly. Uh, just pop them in as a catch crop, and particularly with no dig, because you're not having to worry about weeds too much, so, you know, these things are, are really easy to do. Okay. That, that is five years. I haven't added in this year's to the graphic one yet, but that, the difference this year was quite dramatic, actually, in between the dig and no dig. And... Uh, <coughs> Another thing I find interesting with these figures and recording the harvest is actually just how big they are, even on both beds, because these are beds of 7.5 square meters, giving 100 kilos a year on average. <coughs> so how many vegetables do you need? You know, if you're growing just for yourself and family, you don't need many beds. You don't need a big area, really. So for gardeners, I'm always advising, you know, scale down. Do, it, do, do more on less. You'll save time. You're managing less ground. Um, a more efficient use of water and resources <coughs> and you can get very high yields by being diligent particularly with second plantings and in marketing terms you know if you're growing a market garden similar really it's impressive what you can get from say a thousand square meters maybe 50 shares or something like that so we'll find out more about that when we go to Felix's okay now these are differences we find like dig potatoes no dig see how the soil is sticking to the tubers there. This is harvested on the same day. And that's going back to what I was saying about how in the spring we can get on the ground anytime the soil doesn't stick to your boots. Okay. Dig carrots, no dig carrots. Dig parsnips, no dig parsnips. Um, they all grow, but interesting differences. And this was one of the more dramatic ones. I thought this would be an interesting thing to try this summer. So I uh, <coughs> had someone with a camera there and we I watered Two, very fast, two 12-litre two, um, cans of water on the no-dig bed and on the dig bed. And that was the pho photograph was taken just after 
putting on all that water quite rapidly. So you can see how quickly it's drained in here and how slowly it's draining in there, which is to do with the, um, the soil kind of capping over because this is it's silt soil, it's quite dense and as the water hits it, it, all the fine particles tend to coagulate together and then make a layer which the water finds difficult to get through compared to if you're mulching with compost. So it basically shows the value of surface mulching with compost. This is, uh, gave me great pleasure last autumn, the um, BBC in, in Scotland, not in England, um, the different bodies it seems, and the Scottish BBC run a garden where they decided to do a dig no dig trial and it was run by two really old gardeners, this guy's in his 80s uh, so he's got a lot of experience and you know 80 year old people don't change their mind as fast as young people maybe uh, but he has, uh, he, he was sceptical at first but th this was the results of their dig no dig trial, this was the cauliflower on the dig bed, the cauliflower on the no dig and you know, they were just getting consistently stronger performance from their no dig so this has been great to help create awareness about no dig, which until recently has been pretty much scorned by the horticultural establishment in the UK, in a lot because it's not doing the job properly, or it's being lazy, or whatever it might be. Okay, and we'll see in the next slide here. Oh yeah, there, that's when they, they flew me up to Aberdeen to, um, to talk with Jim on the TV programme. And they did a, another year of dig no dig this year, their third year, and it's been so successful for no dig that they're just converting all their growing yeah, in these television gardens to no do. So, okay. And likewise, this is even more amazing, the Royal Horticultural Society, this is the <coughs> big body of amateur gardeners in the UK, half a million members, you know, it's this huge organisation. And they have, this year they converted their whole garden to no do. Um, it was through their manager coming to a lecture I gave at Kew Gardens in, in London in 2011 and she tried it on her allotment, worked really well. She's now managing this garden. She thought, you know, I gave them all the prod, really. There, there's a, <clears throat> a story in the UK about how many RHS, that's the organisation, council members, people who run it, how many of, of them do you need to change a light bulb? <clears throat> and the answer is, change. <laughs> so, but <laughs> they have. So they're also doing a really interesting thing here is they have students and apprentices, and each, each student has a block like that and that half of it's no dig and half of it's dig so that you know what better way to learn and, and they could do what they like on that and see what happens okay. here's um, another trial <laughs> at Homemakers which originally started rather differently to what it's doing now but basically I was I thought to compare growing vegetables without using any compost at all with using some compost that's there but also digging and no dig so there's different things being trialled there. So this ground was dug, that's been mulched with polythene to kill the grass and weeds. And that one also mulched with polythene and with some compost. Okay, and you can see the beginning of it, oh sorry, subsequently going on. Um, year one, it was interesting how particularly this no dig with no compost, the plants took a while to um, get going compared to where the compost was and compared to where the digging happened. but they caught up towards the end of the summer okay and then we decided to convert this to um, because the the ground without compost was doing so poorly <coughs> um, stuff was very helpful in formulating the new pattern of beds so dividing it into smaller each strip into smaller beds basically that strip is forked or dug this is no dig and that's no dig and these two have different compost green waste and mushroom, finer compost and decomposed cow manure. And planting the same vegetables in each strip, so the three strips. So that kind of goes in rows across like that. And comparing the results. Okay. And another thing, part of this trial is no rotation. So for example, that's the third year in a row of beans in the same soil, third year in a row of squash in the same soil and measuring the harvest, the, the figures up there show you how the biggest harvest was 2015, then it dropped a bit. It, fluctuations, I think, mainly due to weather. Uh, but the no rotation part of this trial I'm finding interesting is just to find out, you know, what happens if you don't rotate. It originated from something called 
Shume, Japanese natural agriculture, where they actually they advocate the opposite of rotation, which is called continuous cropping. Uh, I'm not saying it's a good idea, but it's just interesting to see. So, okay, the next picture <coughs> shows you more very up to date now. So, each of these each of these strips and beds within the strips has two crops a year. So this is after the climbing beans. We plant salads. Take out the bean plants in middle to end of October. Plant salads that were sown in September, and they stay under this mesh <coughs> cloche over winter. We pick them when there's big enough leaves. This was a second planting, which is spinach after the squash. So the curry squash is a really good squash to grow because it crops so early. We harvested it on 28th of August and straight away, same day, planted spinach. And that's already given 14 kilos. So to give you an idea of yields, that this year that area has cropped 36 kilos of squash and it's now cropped 14 kilos of spinach. So we're getting very consistently strong yields here. That area cropped around 30 kilos of broad beans and then 25 kilos of filled kraut cabbage and so on. So it's all double crop, right? And that is the yield comparison. Strip one, we fork the beds every winter or before planting for spring. So putting in a fork, like broad forking, and just levering to loosen and aerate the soil. And it's depressing the yield, basically. Getting slightly less, not on every bed, but the totals every year are slightly <coughs> lower where the ground is forked compared to strip two is no dig, same compost. So these two beds are just comparing forked with no dig. And then strip three is also no dig, but the different compost, which is not so fine, slightly more lumpy, but well decomposed cow manure, cow, cow bedded on straw. And part of the lower total here is not necessarily the growth is less, but more pest damage, a bit more slug damage, because these totals are all about <laughs> harvestable, um, saleable yield. This is not just adding everything. So we're grading out what we don't want to sell. So this is good, good veg in those figures. Okay. So you only brought fork in your trials? No, every year. Every, every year. bed, every year? Yeah. No, so. no. Sorry, Charles, you didn't hear the question properly. Sorry to interrupt. A lady said you only brought fork in your trials. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, I thought you said in year one. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Just literally there. Yeah, the the garden itself, I don't use broad fork at all. Uh, for me, that is not no dig. Yeah, simple fact that is not no dig because you are disturbing soil structure. You're breaking fungal filaments. You're disturbing soil organisms. No dig is about maintaining and encouraging and improving all of those vital things, and you just don't need to do it basically. You might need to do it in year one if you're starting with a really, really tough, difficult, compacted, truly compacted, not just firm soil. Um, beyond that, fine. Just let soil life do it. Very simple. Comes back to that thing, simplicity. So yeah, that's the fork strip, no dig, no digging, from looking from the other end. And that is an uh, example of how much compost we put on every year. So on, on the beds, and then you can see the slightly woody marks on the paths. And these beds are 1.2 meter by 2 meter, 2 meter that direction, 1.2 meter. Pathways of as narrow as I can possibly make them. You know, I don't want wide paths, so they're 35 centimeter on average. Okay. These figures are on my website under the a banner called Three Strip Trial. So I won't delay too long there, but you can just see how the pattern is pretty consistent. Strip one is slightly behind strip two. <coughs> okay. That's actually this year's results. I find these tables quite interesting really because you you can just look across for each vegetable and see how it performed in each different slight slightly different condition. And the first numbers here are the that so that's all the the, the first bed going across, and that's the <coughs> second bed. So this, this is the first planting, second planting squash and spinach. First planting broad beans, second planting filled the crab cabbage. First potato, potato charlotte, followed by leeks. Um, generally, you can see pretty consistently good yields in all of them, but just these small differences 
that you get in the totals at the bottom when you add it all up. Okay. So, right, starting out, no dig. Okay. <coughs> this is the other side of homemakers and looking at different ways of killing the weeds. So, using either compost or maybe uh, landscape fabric and cardboard or just pure polythene to kill the weeds initially. So this is very much a year one photograph when you only see that happening once to kill all this green and get <coughs> vegetables. Okay. On the right there you can see asparagus bed. That's, so that's no dig asparagus, works really well. And simply planting the crowns in the compost with the weeds below. And um, <coughs> there is a bit of weeding maybe needed year one, uh, perennial weeds that come through, but it, on what's going on was it's very clean ground, very easy to maintain asparagus like that. It's not growing on trenches, level ground. And you're going to see something quite shocking in the next photograph for German people, which is green asparagus. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't thought about it actually, but uh, the students yesterday were asking me, so you, you don't grow white asparagus? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so. In, in the UK, we just let it grow above ground, as you can see, and snap it off when it's, you know, about there. So, so that's the harvest. And the harvest of the asparagus bed have been... <coughs> uh, year four was the first year of picking, was five and a half kilos. Year five, nine kilos, and this year, 15 and a half kilos. So it's, it's going up quite steadily. Uh, but it is obviously a very long-term crop. <coughs> and on the right, though, is Steph is picking um, Taunton Dean Kell. That's a, a, a British type of perennial kale. So it's a kale which never makes flowering shoots in the spring, it just keeps making leaves. In theory it could go on forever but in practice it doesn't because like this one here you can see how tall it had got and I've had to stake it and it, in fact it blew over one winter. Uh, so what you need to do is take cuttings of little stems that keep growing on the parent plant. It's very simple. This is what I was saying about woody weeds, like uh, there was a lot of brambles there, lavender I dug out as well, I didn't want that there. And this was homemakers when I arrived, the front garden was very overgrown, really quite um, discouraging actually, but with a bit of help <coughs> um, we got it down to a <laughs> clean condition. Uh, but still not much happening even six months later. Uh, but if you do your groundwork well in year one, then next picture shows you the encouraging results. That's the end of the first summer, and then early in the second summer, that this can now become a very nice flower garden. And if we go on, next picture shows you this year. It's it's a great, very pleasurable place to garden now because the, that wall, there was a lot of bindweed there, and I did it didn't all die in year one with the first mulching. I needed to use a trowel to keep removing it until the parent roots die. There's still a little bit, but really hardly anything. And so one can concentrate on the more pleasant part of the growing. And in the UK, uh, a majority now of flower farmers are no dig. It's, it works really well for flowers. Uh, they're using probably a little, little bit less compost than for growing vegetables. Uh, but partly because some of them are on very poor soil. They're mostly not wealthy people, they haven't got the best land, um, but they're succeeding with flower growing. Um, no dig, because so few weeds, that's the main thing. Okay. So mulching the weeds in year one, you're doing, actually can be doing three things at once, like here. This was uh, a little plot that Felix worked on actually, and we were killing the weeds with polythene, and then as well as feeding the soil with compost, and growing a crop. So it's Clearing the weeds, feeding the soil, taking a harvest can happen all at the same time. But if you use polythene, obviously you can't sow carrots or plant lettuce, but squash like that, courgettes, pumpkins, even potatoes, plants that can be put in quite wide spacing, you just need a few holes in the polythene. There's actually only five plants of crown print squash there. And they gave something like 50 kilos of harvest, okay. And in October then, after the harvest, I pull back the polythene and you can see the compost has really gone in and there's just a few weeds left, which is of course the bindweed. So the bindweed is not killed in one year, but that's not a problem. Some work with the trowel afterwards. There was quite a bit more bindweed here in cooch grass also, but it's not anymore. Okay. Yep. And here again is the bindweed. 
Um, if you're lucky enough ever to be given or have some old woolen carpet, it's a great mulch and uh, covers the weeds very thoroughly and then by the end of year two it's all disappeared because the worms love it. But meanwhile it's killed a lot of weeds, you can see there the difference, that's four months of mulching. But what it hasn't yet killed there but it's weakened is the bindweed. And that's field bindweed, the one you get which makes quite low growing and little pink flowers. So that was work with the trial to lever it out. Okay. And then going on, this is year two in that area, so I put on more compost to make beds, some more woody mulch for the paths, so that's spring and autumn. Okay, so very clean. This is year one again about you know how you kill those weeds initially. This, this is pretty much my favorite method. If I can get enough cardboard and enough compost, and it's one I'd recommend to anybody where you're just literally putting cardboard on whatever's growing at the moment. That's, it just, it's a temporary barrier to the weeds growing. The cardboard maybe lasts <coughs> eight, 10 weeks, and after that time, obviously the weeds can grow through, but that eight week time has really weakened them. And then they've still got to get through, say 15 centimeters of compost. So what does emerge at the end of all that is pretty weak and you can just keep pulling it out and say even cooch grass um, maybe three pullings uh, over a period of two weeks and it's just completely died and it comes back to that thing if you don't disturb the soil even with those vigorous weed roots it just doesn't have that same need to recover so the the weed growth kind of almost voluntarily slackens it's really working with nature this approach okay and that's that area where there was a lot of bindweed and some cooch grass year two, year three. So you can see basically how it's become very abundant ongoing. There's no more cardboard, no more polythene. Subsequently, it's only in year one that you need these special measures. Okay. This was my greenhouse in year one. It had a lot of cooch grass. So this is the cooch roots. That was actually where the um, builder had dug out some turfs uh, to put in concrete, that's the unfortunate bit of a greenhouse, it does need concrete there for the wall. And then inside the greenhouse I have thick cardboard, <coughs> compost on top, actually I put about 20 centimetres, I put extra in the greenhouse, partly because <laughs> I was a bit concerned about you know, that much cooch grass. Uh, but actually, if you go look at the next picture you'll see, um, this was late June, <coughs> and the ground was really clean and I just didn't actually see any cooch grass at all there. It just that, that was a subsequent one in the polytunnel, but it, that, this shows how you've got to really watch the edges. Yes. Um, you need a decent overlap where, when you're using cardboard. 15 centimeter overlap, I would say. It's no good just butting them up to each other. You've got to get that sorted. And, and just watch your edges too. And if you see regrowth, this is my favorite method of dealing with it, so that's bindweed and removing just the surface root, you can't get the parent root, you don't need to try either, but removing that much is, is, is a, or taking a lot already from the parent root and making it weaker. So that's a lovely copper trial. <coughs> um, and have you heard of Victor Schau Schauberger? Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh great, okay. Well, if you haven't, uh, do check him out. He's a fascinating man, Austrian forester. And it's his grandson who now makes these the copper tools, they're called copper, actually, strictly speaking, they're bronze. They have 5% uh, tin, which is, toughens up the copper, makes it stronger. But copper is, is a very kind metal to the soil. Um, it doesn't break down the capillary structure of soil particles as it goes in and out. And magnetic qualities are not so strong, so it doesn't interrupt the magnetic flows. Um, Lots of things, actually, I think we don't fully understand, but the results of using copper tools generally are, are good. They're more expensive, that's the disadvantage, but against that, they last a long time. Because they don't rust, uh, they stay clean and in nice condition for a long time, and the edges stay sharp, and that makes them more efficient to use and easier. Uh, so I warmly recommend them if you don't know them. Okay. What was the name of that? Uh, Schau Schauberger. As PKS is the name of the company who now make these tools in Austria. I'm going to show you the garden. Ah, brilliant, yeah, of course. Uh, here we have the cooch grass. 
So uh, I put this slide up to remember, remind me to make the point of how we put all of this on the compost heap. So roots are perennial weeds. Sometimes it's said that you shouldn't put them on the compost heap because they're going to regrow. Well, no, actually, they die. Uh, you know, they're not invincible. Uh, I think the next picture actually does show me doing that. Can we try that? Yeah, there we are. So that's um, Homemakers Year One. This is where now I have a nice, big, impressive compost bay. This was the very first heap of <laughs> compost at Homemakers in 2013. And I'm putting on bindweed roots there. You know, just it breaks down. That's my experience. That's all I can say. Uh, but yeah, you wouldn't believe sometimes the arguments one could get into. No, it doesn't. <laughs> it does. um, the other thing I put on compost heaps is blighted material. So potatoes, tomatoes, which have had potato blight, late blight. Also, it's safe to compost because blight spores need living tissue to survive. So as soon as the potatoes or tomatoes you put on have decomposed, the blight spores die. They can't live in soil and compost. Um, I've proved this to myself twice by basically making compost from blighted material, putting it in a polytunnel, planting tomatoes, no problem. So that's another time saver, basically. You know, people, I notice how people waste a lot of time doing these things they've been told to do in good faith, uh, they just don't need to do it. <coughs> okay. So, yeah, the copper oscillating hoe. You can get these in steel as well. It's a very nice design because it's a very thin blade. It slides through. Hoeing, hoeing is a, an easy job. <coughs> it, it shouldn't be heavy work. If, if your hoeing is, if you're finding it difficult, you've got a technique you need to improve. Uh, just gentle sliding through the surface or walking along, pulling the hoe. Um, it's quick, it's easy, and it's not disturbing much except for the very surface layer of compost. And the habit to get into is catching weeds small. For me, that's a big weed, actually. That's a fat hen. Uh, because the smaller the weed is, the easier it is to disturb and the more quickly it will die in situ. So these are weeds that we are getting in the spring. <coughs> and that's when I'm being really vigilant to use a hoe. Most of the hoeing at homemakers that we do is in late March and April, and not much after that. And the saying in, in England is, hoe your weeds before you see them. <laughs> which doesn't really make sense, but it's getting a... a key truth which is catch them very very small and it's looking you know it's being proactive about it not waiting to be overwhelmed by the weeds but actually going out in early late winter uh, very early spring and looking for that first sign of weed growth and another interesting thing about that is that generally when you see that very first shimmer of green of new weeds appearing in late winter early spring that's an indication that the soil is approaching being warm enough to make first sowings but not before that and you can actually, if you do a weed strike <coughs> before sowing, that will make your subsequent job much easier because you've removed a lot of weeds already. Mm -hmm. okay. And if it's too wet to hoe, well, hand weed. And that's the size of weed that I like to hand weed. So two leaf stage, and they pull out really easily. So it's less dramatic result in a way, but you, you're achieving a lot because you're removing a lot of potential weed growth very quickly, very easily. Also, at a time of year when probably you have more time to do it than later in the spring. Okay. This photograph was taken by Felix, in fact, and it's March 2016, just raking over the surface of the bed to um, both break up the lumps and kill any germinating weed seeds. Okay. And that's the subsequent shot. This, this shot photograph, by the way, is a complete fake because it's <laughs> fake news. <laughs> Um, but it was it was staged a bit for the calendar cover, so it's, it's the cover shot, and, and uh, we just wanted to get a photograph of me doing something in that part of the garden. Uh, but it was just, in a way, it's to make the point today that you don't need to do that in May much. So in May, I'm not really doing much hoeing, but it's the, using that tool in that way. Okay. This is where you would need to hoe if you've been digging. So that's the difference between the the dug bed surface in late March I think it was and the no dig and if you look very closely here I don't know if you can see them there's a lot of little new weed seeds emerging in the disturbed soil basically compared to very few in the no dig now clearly if you would used a compost with a lot of weed seeds or animal manure with a lot of weed seeds then that would 
also be growing a lot of weed seeds here at this point, and you would need to be hoeing then. Uh, but more effective than that, and I will come on to that later in the morning, making hot compost will help uh, reduce that job significantly. Okay. So, there you go. This is um, Lower Farm, my previous garden. That's not an ideal site for growing vegetables. It's north facing slope, clay soil, and um, also tended to lie very wet. Interestingly, this, my beds were below this field here, which was ploughed by my brother every autumn. And that ploughing caused a lot of surface runoff. You know, ploughing's really bad for drainage, in my experience, on clay soil anyway, because you, you're then creating a, a surface layer which is more crumbly, and you, below you've got the more dense soil, and that makes a capillary um, surface which is very difficult for water to go through as <coughs> it goes sideways. And it was, rain was falling on his field and coming down through my garden. Okay. And I was trialing also there some different ways of growing like apple trees between the vegetables and espalier apples year two. In fact, the next picture shows you year four of doing that. And that was luckily quite a wet summer. The, this doing it quite like I was doing there, I wouldn't recommend actually. The trees are a bit too close and they're on slightly too big rootstock. That's M26. Uh, and it was taking too much moisture. So that competes with the vegetables. Uh, agroforestry, for want of a better word, it's, it's not an easy thing to do with intensive vegetables. Okay. Looking the other way at Lower Farm, so this is clay soil, compost mulch, 1.2 meter wide beds, um, 40 centimeter piles roughly there. Okay. You can see by how by winter they're getting pretty wet, that's water running down from the field above. Generally, I find that if you've got a slope, it's better to have your beds up and down, not across. Which I know contradicts a lot of um, advice and that relates, it comes back to no dig again basically because if you're not digging, you're not breaking the soil structure so it's not gonna wash away with rain. It's gonna just stay there. And I would get a steady flow of water through the paths but it, only very rarely would I get any kind of movement of anything happening down the slope. If you run across a slope, you've got more um, difficulty when you say put compost on and then it will fall into the path below on the slope or if you're watering in the summer sometimes the water runs into the path that kind of thing so it's generally easier to go up and down okay and then close planting like that's onions um, is very easy because the weeds are not a factor really um, onions, even onions I grow as a half season crop, so they're maturing right at the end of July. Uh, next picture shows you September. Uh, chicories, uh, very nice vegetable for autumn cropping. And also salads, th these are planted <coughs> September for um, cropping through winter under a cloche. So you can see the hoop just going on there, and that's the cloche under the snow. So cloches have a great use. I mean, I prefer a polytunnel, it must be said. <laughs> it's kind of a lot easier to work in and everything. Uh, but if you don't have space for a polytunnel or greenhouse, cloches like that, this would be with polythene over or um, mesh, not quite so warm as polythene, but still effective. Um, generally, I wouldn't use fleece on a cloche because it's more fragile and tends to get damaged by winter wind. Okay. This was um, arriving at Homemakers when I started out. I had this huge trees uh, planted in the 1960s as a windbreak, they're spruce trees. And uh, my first decision was to have them cut down. It was like, no, it was so dark. And also, trees like this root a long way, so they'd be taking moisture from you know, all of this ground here. So that's why they're not there in the second picture, and it's now apple trees. Uh, before they were cut down though, I had a very stern looking woman walk up the drive uh, in December 2012 and introduce herself as my new neighbour. And she said, I hear you're going to have these trees cut down. And uh, I said, yeah. And she said, uh, I thought I'd let you know you're going to make a lot of people very happy. Okay. <laughs> so she was living in that house there, you can see why. Um, but generally I recommend, you know, if you've got tall trees or hedges near to your vegetables, generally not a good idea, see if you can do something about it. Um, and I use this area now for the compost being delivered, that works well. 
Um, next picture shows you actually a nicer view of this area last June when we had an open day. And yeah, you can see just the nice abundance. But it's, it's good to have that this sort of arriving area. In fact, I, I'd be very fortunate at Homemakers it's because it has got this. This is potential good car parking for cars, even on the grass, and it gets really full when we run courses, just fitting all the cars in. Okay. This was planting trees, where the <coughs> spruce trees were, you can see the stumps there, and so that made a, I wanted to have a bit of a boundary and planted these apple trees December 12th, and they're what's called one year maidens, so very young trees. That's the cheapest kind of tree you can buy and it's easiest to quickest to plant only needs a small hole i get asked sometimes on youtube you know oh with no dig how do you plant an apple tree <laughs> so like, well i dig a hole <laughs> um, but just a small one <laughs> and then from then on it's mulching so what's important for me here is killing the weeds not not having weeds close to young trees makes a huge difference to their growth more than anything really some feeding of the soil with not brilliant composting bits of old or young stable manure even but these trees, 1.2 metre only planting time, you see the next picture, year one and year two, so already in year one, decent formation of branches, which suddenly by year two becomes a tree, a proper tree. Um, I've tried over the years planting bigger trees, like two-year-old apple trees, and noticed how they, by year three, you actually realise you've got stronger growth from planting a smaller and cheaper tree, so that's why I'm recommending it. Okay, I mean, look at this year three and four. So four years ago on the right, those trees were like little sticks. You know, that's all happened in four summers, basically. And I started off cropping under them winter squash, but then by year three, it wasn't working anymore because their roots are using all this ground, which I'm still keeping weed free. Okay. <clears throat> if you want smaller apple trees, the M27, that's the smallest rootstock you can use. And these trees are the same age as the ones you saw in the previous photograph. You can see how much smaller they are just by having a small rootstock. Uh, M27 smallest, and M9 is also good. They're both good for small gardens. And that's a brilliant rootstock for plums on the right there. That's a variety of plum called opal on a rootstock called pixie. And so that's a five-year-old plum tree. So you can see how it's just staying very manageable, basically. Easy to pick the plums. Not a huge harvest, but a very nice harvest. Um, I mean, often one has too many plums. I find these just a decent amount, really. So yeah, year one, making beds, different materials, different methods, and here I didn't use cardboard in the piles originally. It's actually a lot easier if you do it all in one go, cardboard, and then that overlaps the edges with the compost a bit on top at the edge, but not too much. Okay. Well, here was an example of creating a little garden. This was the first garden I made, November 12th, and it's just 25 square metres. I used a scythe to cut the weeds down, cardboard on top for paths, compost on top for beds. There were actually no perennial weeds there, so that was really easy. And that's become now, next picture shows small garden, we call it, so how much food you can get from that. And the, that's the subject of quite a few YouTube videos he's just going through the year and seeing. So even there, May to November, you can see quite different plantings, croppings. Even here, tomatoes, like cherry tomatoes in the summer, they have 12 kilos of tomatoes from those seven plants. <coughs> I under sowed them in August with spinach, so the tomatoes are gone, but already there's spinach growing. So it's about overlapping crops as well, doing everything to get maximum. That's onions there, harvested late July, kale planted straight away uh, for autumn cropping. Okay. So paths, um, just different methods of getting them clean. Cardboard's certainly key, okay. Uh, the wood shavings are useful to keep it down, otherwise I'm using stones as well, putting a stone on each overlap. Uh, so a good stock of stones is always useful as well. And this is, gives an idea of path and bed width. So these beds are not much more than a metre wide, and that bed is 2.3 metres wide. <laughs> That's my two extremes. Uh, I think if I had a choice, I, it, the easiest for me that, that would work best would be 1.2 metre wide beds, uh, the, but there are many options. Um, for example, with 1.2 metre you, you can use a 2 metre wide roll of fleece to cover most things or other materials. 
Um, but all these things are worth considering before you get going. Okay. And even though the pathways are narrow, you know, you can still push a wheelbarrow through very narrow pathways. Pathways don't need to be big, but think of paths as part of your beds. Your pathways are not dead space. And this goes back to what I was saying about firm soil. Firm soil is good. So the paths are contributing to plant growth. And that's why I actually quite like narrow paths, but I'm looking after my paths, I keep my paths weed free. I feed the soil in the paths, it's just as it's a more woody mulch than the compost on the beds. Okay. And this was um, spring and then autumn. So this was just recently. We were looking at these beetroot and noticing how they, they were much bigger near to the paths. These are beetroot planted in July after lettuce. And in the very dry conditions we've had, I've noticed that the vegetables closer to the paths have been bigger than the ones in the middle of the bed. And you might have thought, well, surely they'd be bigger in the middle because there's more goodness in the bed and everything. But with the storms we had in August, the moisture then was being held in the, in the path mulch and in the soil below that. And then the vegetables were able to root into that. And they could access more moisture, basically. It's, that's the reason for it compared to the plants in the middle where it stayed smaller. So paths is important. You know, don't neglect your paths. Think of them as a positive part of the garden. It's not just dead space that you walk on. They're a very valuable part of your whole growing area. Okay. This was mulching uh, again year one. That was the asparagus bed where I didn't mulch enough and we needed to put cardboard on um, with some landscape fabric. This stuff is, I wouldn't ever use that again actually. It was just trialing it. Um, path mulch year one, okay. And that's wood chip mulch, part decomposed. So this is before putting it on. You can see quite wet, a little bit of water line. That photograph was taken after very heavy rain. It's not often that I see water in the past. Okay. And that was last winter. So we're just starting there to put on these um, wood shavings marks. That's actually six month old wood shavings, but it's oak, so it breaks down very slowly. I was a little bit nervous about using that, but it has, in fact, decomposed pretty rapidly in the end. It's fine to use wood on the surface, but not in the soil. That's the difference. You know, when it's dug in, then you get the nitrogen robbery, but you don't get that happening when woody mulches are on the surface. Just what you don't want is too much wood, uh, like big wood pieces getting in the way of the vegetables or harboring slugs. So small wood is better. Whereas in the polytunnel, I'm not using any particular path mulch, a bit of compost if anything, mainly to, to feed the soil and also keep the level not too different to the beds. I don't want great high beds with steep sides. so. Um, generally my beds are just slightly higher than the paths and here you can see we really keep the path width to a minimum because in under cover every square centimeter is so precious and so um, Steph does complain actually when we're picking salad you know couldn't we have a bit wider path to put the bucket or something <laughs> um, so these lettuce for example we're picking at the moment every week or every two weeks sometimes taking off the outer leaves and that's before and after harvest and this is a wonderful variety of lettuce. I don't know if you can buy the seed here. It's called Grenoble Red. So the town of Grenoble in the French Alps. Uh, Rouge, Rouge Grenobloise in French. And um, I, because you can't buy good seed, and also because I want to save seed, so I just let one, in March, I select one plant, let it go to seed, and that makes thousands of seeds, which these are planted from. So I've been doing that for eight years now. In fact, the plant, these are, See, the parent of these was growing right there, and um, that made all the seeds which I collected and then sowed in September, planted October, that photographs November. Okay. And we'll just whiz through this section and then stop for a tea and coffee. Um, this is still on sort of soil and basics of no dig. Okay. Right. Fungi. So you just don't see them much, if at all, except when they're fruiting. So that fruiting bodies of fungi are mushrooms or toadstools. Sometimes you can eat them. Mostly we don't dare. But if you see them generally, I reckon that's good. Fungi have been given a bad name because of things like potato blight and um, honey fungus, but most fungi are good. Okay. 
these uh, ones interest me. I, if anybody knows what these are, I'd be fascinated to hear if you can identify what fungi that is. But I see a lot of them um, on the no dig, on the compost mulch, and into the soil. And that's the the mycelia there. Often when we're harvesting, <coughs> uh, you see it. The soil is quite white, even. Yeah, it's like even it, it's, you think, oh, it's okay. It just looks so white, but the crops are great. You know, for me, that's what telling me it's okay. Mm -hmm. Fantastic growth of vegetables, um, but the, also the smell is lovely. It's 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 like um, mushrooms, basically forest smell. Okay, this is where I, I did dig a hole just to see. Uh, September two thousand ten. This is lower farm, so it's clay. Um, yeah, otherwise I don't know what's going on. So this was fascinating at the bottom. And um, you can see so many holes. <coughs> really encouraging to see that what was going on in that clay soil. Uh, the structure is really good, basically. So you've got good drainage, good aeration, easy root penetration in clay, okay? And as a result, you can get lovely long parsnips. I'm look at this. <coughs> So that's with sowing the parsnip seeds in the surface compost. Uh, it's often said you shouldn't add compost before you grow carrots and parsnips because it makes them fork. I think that's because it's, the soil's been dug as well. It's, you know, it doesn't relate to no dig. A lot of these sayings don't work with no dig. So most of that kind of stuff that you hear, you can forget about and just start fresh. Keep the simplicity. And it's all about feeding the soil. <coughs> so basically you get more parsnips and more carrots where you have fed the soil. So that's why I'm putting on my mulch <coughs> on all the beds once a year, whether I'm growing heavy feeders or light feeders. I don't think in those terms, I know, but that's the more traditional way of looking at it. Um, but th this becomes so simple. You're just feeding your soil and then sowing or planting for whatever you are going to sow and plant. And you know that the soil is fed, so you're going to get a decent harvest of crop. Okay. What about insects? Insects? Yeah. Uh, I don't have one. <laughs> Yeah, nice well, flies and all cabbage flies. We, we, wait and see, that will come in the next section actually. Uh, generally though, with this approach, is you, soil is healthy, so that's one thing is you get less pest damage. This is homemaker soil, so we've got uh, silt, you can see the difference, it's not so yellow. Uh, it's actually lovely soil. Okay, the next picture shows you a big heap of it, where uh, I just had this cabin built, a rather beautiful building on um, local larch timbers and because it was it's going to be there I hope for a long time I thought well a bit of a waste of soil so I got a digger to dig out the soil where that now is and that was what came out and you can see what lovely soil it is we've been using that all that bit in the front that's disappeared is what I've been putting in compost heap because I'm thinking what am I going to do with all this soil <laughs> and uh, at the moment, anyway, one use I've got is adding it to make more compost, basically, because soil, within limits, soil can be an addition to compost as long as I want to get it hot enough. So it's a, it's a brown factor addition to the heap. If you've got enough green and you've got some spare soil like that, you know, you could add a bit more soil. It'd still, still be hot to kill the wheezies. Okay. These parsnips gave a nice soil profile. So these are ones that we managed to get out last March. This was using a sharp copper spade. Um, vertically near the parsnip and levering a bit and pulling on the parsnip crown and that much comes out but you can see how the soil colour changes the compost enriched surface and then you go down it's actually quite clay by the time we get down here and, and very sticky so that not like you'd want to be doing any digging into that soil but it's very nice to have it down there okay here's this, these show graphically the difference between dig and no dig of clay soil so that's the dig bed of clay at Low Farm in summer. Photographs are taken on the same day between parsnips as it happens. Okay. <clears throat> what do you do if you've got that kind of issue with soil? What would you call that? Many people, I think, would call that compacted soil. In fact, I would call that smeared soil, which means the surface has been skidded together by the machine and squashed. Uh, I made a little hole with a trial to find out. The builder was making a conservatory here and driving on it a lot in wet weather in January. And, but underneath this surface damage, the soil was still nice. So basically I didn't do anything, you know, I didn't take a fork or a spade to that, I waited for it to dry out. Next picture shows you at March, April and June. So 
all I did there was I leveled it off just with a spade taking off the tops and putting them in the hollows just to get it even. Scattered grass seed, one centimetre compost and it grew grass basically. That's not to say that at that point in June or July that the soil was healed but it's, it's healing. You know the process is happening and it's better for it to be happening with grass and worms love grass roots and so it was, it's all worked out really well. Very simple. Okay. Yeah, quickly, let's just finish with this one. So this was looking at, this is a bit more detail about that trial of comparing dig no dig uh, without compost and through this <laughs> Japanese um, farmers who, basically they, this Japanese nat natu natural, natural agriculture is fascinating because it's, they have three principles. One is no compost. The second is no rotation, that's the continuous cropping. And the third is save your own seed. <coughs> And I, for me, the, the, the most key one of that is save your own seed if you can do it. But it's, that's not an easy thing to do. You know, some vegetables are easy and some are not, to be honest. Uh, I save what I can. But anyway, these guys, they're Japanese. They helped me. Well, I persuaded them to do the digging. <laughs> you know, come on, let's have a look at this trial. You can do the digging there. Um, then the no dig bed was mulched. Okay, nuts. Are we all right? Um, so, yeah, that was May. Um, so that, that strip has now been mulched with polythene to kill the grass and this, the grass was turned <coughs> over. It was a lot easier planting, I must say, into the dug soil than it was planting into the very heavy, uncomposted um, surface of the node initially. Okay. I did actually, I just remember as I mentioned it, the, um, we had a bit of regrowth. The polythene wasn't on for quite long enough, it was on for three months and a week. And there was a bit of regrowth of grass happening here. I was worried that it would um, become strong. So I did just cut with the spade and flicked over the top two centimetres just to make sure that wouldn't regrow. But basically that's dig no dig comparing growth in July, early July. Same plantings going across each strip. And the next picture shows you same thing October and November. And generally how as the year wore on there, the uh, no dig caught up. Um, when, when you dig soil you get a flush of nutrient release from bacterial stimulation exposure to air and oxidation which initially gives stronger growth but it's in the long term it's not beneficial partly because you've lost carbon to oxidation and damage to soil fungi and so on. Okay. And this was actually comparing with the third strip so that's no dig without compost and no dig with compost. So. That's, that difference is what persuaded me not to carry on with <laughs> doing the no compost. Okay, and then that's the same area following year where we'd reconfigured this trial and this is the strip which we're forking once a year and that's the no dig same compost. But all of this, all of those strips have compost. Okay. And just to quickly finish with a little word on watering. So. Um, when, when I'm sowing seeds, that's my preferred way of doing it, is <coughs> putting water in the drill. And it's very interesting how this works, I think, because you've, got, you've then got moist conditions there and you've got dry there. So you sow the seed on the moist line that you've made with a watering can, or you could do it with a hose. Uh, but it's actually much more effective not to water the whole bed, because then when you sow the seed and you rake over the surface with the dry compost, mostly it is on top, that makes a capillary layer, a boundary, where, which stops the water evaporating through the dry surface material. It stays down where the seeds are germinating and the seed roots go down. And then just re you need to resist the temptation, it's not easy, to water. And then you suddenly see little seedlings appear in what looks like very dry conditions. And the seedlings though, I'm watering, this is where I'm raising plants and I'm watering them every day, every twice a day in really hot weather. Um, with the rose pointing downwards, that works really well. Get a good jet of water onto the leaves, that makes them stronger. Okay. Uh, another thing I'm doing, in, in the UK it's often said that you shouldn't water in bright sunlight because then uh, it scorches the leaves, sun refracting through the water droplets. It's simply not true. I mean, if it was, you know, there'd be catastrophe every time there was a summer thunderstorm because then the sun comes out and the leaves are wet. Oh, hang on. <laughs> so the, the point about watering for me is just, you know, it's a job needs doing, and so we do it when we've got time. 
Yeah, it's, it's rare with any jobs in the garden that you can do them at the perfect moment. You've just got to fit it all in somehow in the day. And quite often watering happens at midday. And uh, there I'm either do it with watering cans like that <coughs> or with a hose. And, but putting on enough water so that it really soaks in and not too, therefore not a high proportion of surface evaporation. Okay. Shall we have a real quick break? Yeah, well, I was just thinking that I'm going to finish on that one now and then, yeah, that's, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not moving far for a while, so if you want to come and ask questions, but we, we will have some question answer as well um, at the end. Okay, tea and coffee then. Thank you.